Book 5. How Callerho, the most beautiful of women, married Charius, the handsomest of men, by Aphrodite's management. How in a fit of lover's jealousy, Charius struck her, and to all appearances she died. How she had a costly funeral, and then, just as she came out of her coma in the funeral vault, tomb robbers carried her away from Sicily by night, sailed to Ionia, and sold her to Dionysius. Dionysius' love for her, her fidelity to Charius, the need to marry caused by her pregnancy, Theron's confession, Charius' journey across the sea in search of his wife, how he was captured, sold, and taken to Caria with his friend Polycharmus, how Mithridates discovered his identity as he was on the point of death and tried to restore the lovers to each other. How Dionysius found this out through a letter and complained to Pharnaces, who reported it to the king, and the king summoned both of them to judgment. This has all been set out in the story so far. Now I shall describe what happened next. As far as Syria and Cilicia, then, Calerho found her journey easy to bear. She heard Greek spoken. She could see the sea that led to Syracuse. But when they reached the Euphrates, beyond which there is a vast stretch of an unending land, it is the threshold of the king's great empire, then she longed for her country and family welled up in her. And she despaired of ever returning. She stood on the bank of the river, told everyone to leave her except Planjon, the only person she could trust, and began to speak. Malicious fortune, insistently attacking a lone woman. You shut me up alive in a tomb, then let me out, not from pity, but to hand me over to pirates. The sea and Theron, between them, brought me into exile. I, the daughter of Hermocrates, was sold as a slave, and harder for me to bear than having none to love me. I roused a man's love, and so, while Charius was still alive, married another, and now you grudge me even this. Now it is not Ionia where you keep me exiled, the land you allotted me to, up to now was admittedly a foreign country, but it was Greek, and there I could take great comfort in the thought that I was living by the sea. Now you are hurling me from my familiar world. I am at the other end of the earth from my own country. This time it is Miletus you have taken from me. Before it was Syracuse. I am being taken beyond the Euphrates, shut up in the depths of barbarian lands, where the sea is far away, I, an island woman. What ship can I hope will come sailing after me from Sicily now? I am even being torn from your tomb, Charius, who shall pour libations over you, benevolent spirit. Bactra and Susa are my home from now on, and my tomb. Only once, Euphrates, am I going to cross you. It is not the length of the journey that frightens me, but the fear that there, to someone, will think me beautiful. With these words, she kissed the ground, stepped on board the ferry, and crossed the river. Now, Dionysius' own entourage was large, as he wanted to make an impressive show of his wealth to his wife. But the attentions of the local people made their progress even more royal. One community escorted them to the next. One satrap gave them into the care of his neighbor. Her beauty won all hearts. The Persians were encouraged, too, by the expectation that this woman would acquire great power. So they all eagerly offered gifts or tried in some way to secure her goodwill for the future. That was how things were on their side. Mithridates, for his part, took the route through Armenia and traveled more energetically, mostly because he was afraid the king might hold it against him if he followed in Calerho's footsteps. 
but also because he was anxious to get there first and prepare for the trial. When he reached Babylon, then that was where the king was staying, he spent the day quietly in his own quarters. All the satraps have residences set aside for them. The next day he went to the palace and greeted the Persian peers. Then he paid his respects to the eunuch Artaxtes, the greatest and most powerful man at court, offering him gifts, and said, Inform the king that his slave Mithridates has come to refute the slanderous charge of a Greek and to do homage. The eunuch soon returned from the king's presence and said, it is the king's hope that Mithridates is innocent. He will pass judgment when Dionysius too arrives. So Mithridates made his obeisance and, oh, obeisance and left. When he was by himself, he called Charius and said to him, I'm being put on trial. Because I tried to restore Calerho to you, I am being accused of a crime. That letter you wrote to your wife, Dionysius says I am the author of it, and thinks he can prove I am trying to seduce his wife. He is convinced you are dead. Well, let him remain convinced until the trial. You can appear out of the blue. I ask you, in recognition of my generosity to you, to stay in hiding. Steal yourself not to see Calerho and not ask about her. Much against his will, Charius accepted this. For all his efforts to avoid notice, tears ran down his cheeks. Sir, he said, I will do as you bid me. And he went off to the room where he was staying along with his friend Polycharmus, threw himself on the ground, tore his clothing, and with both hands he took dark dust and poured it over his head, defiling his lovely countenance. Calerho, he sobbed, we are so close that we may not see each other. It is not your fault. You do not know that Charius is alive. It is I who am the most godless man on earth. I am forbidden to look at you, and coward that I am, so enamored of life, I submit to such gross tyranny. If you had such an order, you would not have chosen to live. Well, Polycharmus tried to console him, but by now Dionysius too was near Babylon, and rumor was overrunning the city in anticipation, proclaiming to all the imminent arrival of a woman of superhuman, divine beauty, such as did not exist anywhere else under the sun. Barbarians are naturally passionately fond of women, so every house, every alley, was filled with report of her beauty. The reports reached the king himself, and he actually asked the eunuch Artaxtes whether the woman from Miletus had arrived. As for Dionysius, he had long been troubled by his wife's celebrity. It made him feel insecure. Now that he was on the point of entering Babylon, he burned still more with anxiety. With a sigh, he said to himself, Dionysius, this is no longer your own city, Miletus, and even you were constantly on the alert for plots against you. Rash, short-sighted man, bring Calerho to Babylon, which is full of men like Mithridates. Menelaus could not keep Helen in security in virtuous Sparta, king though he was. A barbarian shepherd supplanted him. And there is many a Paris among the Persians. Can you not see the dangers? Can you not see them already coming up on you? We are welcomed by cities, entertained by satraps. She has already grown more proud, and the king has not yet seen her. Clearly, my only hope of security lies in smuggling her into the city. She will be safe if I can keep her out of sight. 
On coming to that conclusion, he mounted his horse, but left Callerhoe in the carriage and closed the curtains, and perhaps he would have succeeded in his aim if events had not following, taken the following turn.